While God keeps me in a series, because it's his idea, not mine, and, and I always go with that. And so we were in uh, Acts chapter 1 uh, through uh, verse 11 last week, and this week he said, keep going. <laughs> and so we're going to be in Acts chapter 1, starting at uh, verse 12, and we're going to go through... Um, Acts 2, 4 today, and we are still really talking about what is a New Testament church, Uh, but here we're talking about what is our response to being a member of that New Testament church, and so the title of the message is Isolation or Influence. The answer to that, if you put a question mark there, Isolation or influence is yes. Pretty good, right? Easy to answer. Should we isolate or should we influence people? Yes. You do whatever Holy Spirit tells you, and he's going to have times where you isolate and listen to him, and he's going to have times where you go and influence other people with what you've heard, what you've been told, what you've been fed. What's maturing you? Does that make sense? And so, how did the kingdom of God expand from 120 people to 3,000 people in a week and to 8,000 people in two weeks and then cover the entire known world in about three years at that time? The entire known world at that time. How did that happen? Well, let's go to Scripture. Acts chapter 1. We'll look at verses 12 through 14. And uh, here's what the Word says. Then they, which is the, uh, the, the 120, returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olive Grove, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. And so, uh, and so, um, and it says in 14, all these were continually united in prayer, along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So there were more than just the 12, or actually at that time, 11. And there had to be more than just Mary and, the, and other women and his brothers, but there had to be more people because it was in that upper room where they chose another person from among that 120 to rise up and be an apostle. And so we know there were about 120 people in that group. And so anyway, what happened is the uh, multiplication did not occur in isolation. It occurred because of isolation. So what they heard in isolation, they took to the streets then and created multiplication. Jesus didn't just go, oh, just make sure one or two people get saved every week. It'd be good. One or two people get saved every year. It's okay. Just open the doors of your church and just sit inside and wait for people to come and then just just be happy if one or two people get saved every once in a while. That's not the plan. That's not what happened in that first century church. And what happened in that first century church is the model we're to live by. So what did they do? They took time. They isolated unto God. They were discipled by the Holy Spirit. And then they took that and they went out into the streets and they influenced eventually the entire known world at that time. I know that we're an older group of people. But listen, if you just give me three years, we can repeat that. In three years, we could influence thousands of people if we would just understand you can't just isolate into the four walls of a church. We also have to take what we learn there and go to the streets. Go to the place you work. I've said this so many times, I get tired of hearing myself say it. Your workplace, your school, 
the playground, the convenience store, the restaurant, wherever you go, that's your mission field. That's the place where we're called to influence from what we've been given in isolation. That's why we study the Word every day. We are isolating with the Holy Spirit so then we can go out of our house and influence the world with what we've learned. That's, that's easy. That's just all it takes. That's the pattern here in the first century church, and that's the pattern he wants for today. In verses uh, 13 and 14, then, it shows us that, um, that they, they were in a room isolated, and it lists out the apostles and a few other people, and they were continually united in prayer. This circle means something. I know I'm off camera. That prayer circle is not an option. It's key to the isolation where we come inside together and we defeat the enemy on every one of his schemes so that when we go out, the gospel of the kingdom is not hindered wherever we go. We got into a vein of praying last week, last Wednesday, where it was very much missional prayer. It was about taking what we've been given and going out into the community and, and, and the highways and the byways and, uh, and doing the work that we're called to do to influence people. We look then at Acts 1, 21 through 26. It says, Therefore, from among the men who have accompanied us during the whole time, the Lord Jesus, uh, the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, from among these it is necessary that one become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph called Barabbas, or Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, You, Lord, know the hearts of all. Show which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this apostolic service that Judas left to go to his own place. Then they cast lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Isolation breeds preparation. The purpose of isolation is to get prepared for the apostolic service, for the evangelization, whatever your gift is, whatever your uh, mission field is, isolation breeds the preparation that sets you on your journey. To be sent by God, you have to have, just like Paul and Barnabas had a year of ministering before the Lord, before they were commissioned by men and then sent by the Holy Spirit into their mission. Same thing happened here. Same thing happens here. This service should be the smallest part of anything we ever do. This service should train us, equip us, and uh, mature us to be sent out to do what God has gifted us to do. Wherever that is, whatever it is. So this is important. The isolation is important, but it should lead to us influencing outside the four walls here. Make sense? Amen. I agree. So there you go. Yeah. All right. So how does isolation, how does it breed influence? So glad you asked that. I have the answer to that. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Let me jump on my bandwagon again. Together means they were in one place at the same time. They weren't online. They weren't watching a video a week later. They were all together in one place. Now, if you're sick, if you're shut in, if you're on vacation, those things are great. But you can't be online and consider yourself, every Sunday, and consider yourself assembled with the saints. Because you aren't. 
it's crucial that we come together and isolate for a few moments so we can be charged with our mission and then go out and influence the world. Okay? Thus saith the Lord, right here. So, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. And tongues like flames of fire that were divided appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in different languages as the Spirit gave them ability for speech. Isolation leads to exhibiting influence. What does it mean to exhibit your influence? It means that's where you perform from your isolation. Whatever God spoke you in, in, in the quiet, he now expects you to exhibit that in public. <clears throat> Whatever you learn in private, he expects you to do that in public. There's no room for someone who speaks a good game but can't do a good game. I had, he's passed away now, but I had a, a accounting professor in college who was a really, really good teacher. And uh, my best friend at the time when I was going to college, John was a guy and his dad owned an accounting firm in the town uh, where I lived. And so um, John and I were taking this accounting class and he leaned over to me one day and he said, some can teach and some can do. And I looked at him and I'm like, what? And he goes, um, Mr. Whipple comes to work for my dad during the summer. And my dad says, he's a great teacher, but he's not a great accountant. But his teaching led many people to go on to accounting degrees. And the point of this story is not to make fun of Mr. Whipple, because he was an awesome teacher. The point is, is the scripture doesn't give us that opportunity to be good at just one or the other. Scripture says, whatever you learn, you have to do in front of people. You can't just believe in those principles. You have to actually act upon those principles. And that is what creates exhibiting influence in our culture, in our cities, in our states, in our country, and in the world. The isolation was necessary because it was preparation for the next season of ministry. When you, read, when you read the Bible and you read the stories, Old Testament and New, and you read all that stuff, everything God is doing leads to the next season. When the Bible says God's always doing a new thing, that's what it means. He's always preparing us for the next move that he's going to do. And if we don't get in isolation with him and spend some time just receiving from Holy Spirit, we're not going to know what to do when that season comes. So we've got to be in tune with him so that we can be in touch with what he wants to do on the earth. Amen? Cool. God's order and protocol are established in that isolation. The way he wants us to do everything that we're supposed to do is established there. I, I remember when, when I got the vision for Culture Mission Ministries, uh, I, I got some visions and uh, I heard the Holy Spirit give me very express and, and definitive details of how this ministry would uh, look. And I, it was over a, about a month, that whole month of January 2016, where he was just guiding me and giving me visions and giving me, uh, just, just, uh, just speaking to me about how we should do it. And I mean, it was like, it was so easy to start because he'd just shown me everything we were to do. And all I had to do was just obey his voice and he would do the rest. And today we have a, a, a school that's been going for seven years. We have about 21 people this year. Uh, that's the second largest group we've ever had. But it's the first group that has sustained and kept the same number from beginning to now we're near ending the first semester and we've never had one sustain that long and so I'm really excited about that 
but um, and so um, the the raw and real that Cheryl does came from that, and it has just grown and expanded. Amazing. How many years? Four or five, five years. A year in Clinton, and then four years here. And uh, you know, started out with with five people in leadership, and a few people coming to now sometimes 30 people from all different churches. We had two people drive from Des Moines just for that yesterday, or uh, yeah, yesterday, and then drove home. We had one drive from or somewhere else somebody came from. Well, then we had a bunch come from Clinton. And so, I mean, it's like, this is like, this is reaching things. And I just got to tell you, if you're here and you're not coming to that, you're missing something because it truly is the the corporate body of Christ that's coming and meeting. And you're, you're missing it if you're just not coming because it's, uh, you don't want to or whatever. I'm just telling you, God's doing things there. People are growing like crazy because it's it's a season of ministry that God has ordained. And so the other things, we've got a Bible study in Clinton that has become uh, just such a family and a community that are now ministering to one another outside the couple hours we meet twice a month for Bible study. It's actually, we are friends and com- in community and family members. We're praying for each other's kids and all kinds of stuff. And it's just amazing. And all that stuff came from God's speaking to me over that month of a period of, of time and saying, do this, do that, go here, go there. And we just have obeyed. God's order and protocol are crucial, crucial to the kingdom mission and vision. There's a way God wants things done. And if we miss that order and protocol, we're missing what he has for us in that. I am, I am beyond blessed when we have a Saturday like we had a week from yesterday. And uh, because we went to this conference and had to postpone school for a week, um, people have a schedule. And so only about five or six, maybe seven people could come. And we just, we just did something completely different. And uh, we, we just talked about some scriptural principles and uh, we uh, had some great discussion. I mean, it was fabulous. I was pulling people up from the tables just to teach something that they had revelation on and it was just so good. And then after things got done, we finished about 40 minutes early at about 10 to 12 and uh, nobody left till 2.30. Because what happened is we just stayed in fellowship. Somebody had uh, brought in a couple of pizzas. Uh, somebody had met here at the church to go uh, do some, uh, some stuff in the community. And they asked if they could just park in the parking lot. And they had some pizza for their workers before they went and did that. So they just brought two full pizzas into us. We just ate pizza and fellowshiped for another uh, almost uh, about hour and, and uh, 50 minutes or so, whatever that hour, two hours, three hours, I don't know, it was a long time. And uh, from, from, from 11.50 till 2.30, we just sat there and I was like, we were going to go see our grandkids because we hadn't seen them in a while. And I was like, okay, folks. Yep. Okay. Okay. And then we'd start a vein of conversation. It was all good. And uh, everything worked out and it was good. But I mean, it was just like, it was supernatural. And that's the kind of stuff that, that understanding is order and protocol because it wasn't really necessarily about what we taught, but it was about what we created. That's what communitas is. That word communitas is when a group of people comes together under one cause and they have a goal and they work together to meet that goal. And in the process, whether they meet the goal or not isn't important. It's the community they create doing so that God uses and bless us through. That's why the school is called Communitas Academy. We're teaching people to come together, be a community, to go after God with everything we got. And in the process, we create the body of Christ in this community where we're all ministering to one another 
and we're fellowshipping together, and we're getting stuff done for the kingdom. Amen? Amen. So here's the deal. This is really cool. Here's where uh, isolation and influence will mix. In those first four verses of chapter 2, the baptism of the Holy Spirit can never be contained in isolation. There's nowhere in this chapter 2 where it says they got up and they went outside. When the baptism of the Holy Spirit came, all of a sudden they were ministering in the streets. It doesn't tell us how that happened. What happened is it couldn't be contained in the upper room. And so they, at some point, someone said, we got to take this to the streets, and they went. It doesn't tell us how. It, it's like almost like Philip being translated from one part of the country to the next. I mean, we don't know if that's what happened. But all of a sudden, they were outside preaching to multitudes. And in that course, 3,000 people came into the kingdom. That's where isolation becomes influence. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is not about you or me. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is about us working from what the Father gives us to be influencers over all the earth. It's not about getting your prayer, getting a tongue or a prayer language. Those are side things that happen. What it's about is becoming one corporate body working toward one goal. In the beginning, when, when, before Jesus was crucified, when the uh, disciples got together, they thought about who was the greatest. It was all about, what's my position? What's my title? Where do I get to minister? When do I get to minister? And once Jesus resurrects from the dead, and he meets with them for 40 days, talking about kingdom issues, they go up into the upper room, they're baptized with the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden, they're a seamless team. Nobody cares about who's leader. We can't even identify if there was one leader. Because why? Because they all knew Jesus was the head of the church. So they didn't try to take his place. Today, in some of our churches, we got everybody fighting for the power. And then we wonder why church isn't working today. We're supposed to be humble work together as a team, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, working together as a team, training and people to do the work of the ministry, and nobody gets the glory because God gets the glory. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does. It sends us on our mission. It's not about you personally getting goosebumps. That's a benefit. And I got goosebumps. But that's just a benefit. That's just something like within me to confirm this is something supernatural happening. What it's about is it's about us getting fitted and ready to go on mission for Christ. We get baptized in the Holy Spirit so that all of a sudden I'm now immersed in Christ's mission. That's it. His mission was not to create a church on every corner and have people stay inside of them. The point for the church was to come together and meet. don't need a building to do that. Some of us have buildings. That's all fine and dandy. But we come together. We isolate for a few moments so that we can get trained and equipped and matured. And then we leave that place and we go out into our mission field. That's the whole purpose. In fact, if you go out the door today after church is over, Read the sign above the second set of doors. You are now entering your mission field. That's our ministry. We have ministries inside this church, but they pale in comparison to what our ministry is outside. Make sense? Cool. When they began to exhibit kingdom influence after the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the culture shifted and the church began to multiply. Church growth does not happen through marketing on Facebook. Facebook is fine if you want to market on it in between all the stupid ads. And if you market something they don't like, you'll go to Facebook jail. That's not persecution. (laughs) 
going to think, oh, I'm in Facebook jail for 30 days. That's not persecution, folks. <clears throat> the culture shifted and the church began to multiply when they left their isolation and became influencers. After the initial outpouring, they created a healthy balance between isolation and influence. Take time out for the Lord, get filled up, go out and influence the world with that, what you got filled with. You know why? When you read that, uh, that, that word fullness or when it says someone was filled with the Holy Spirit, that word actually means continually being filled. Why do we need to be continually being filled? Because when we go influence people, we're pouring that out. So we come back into isolation to get filled back up so we have more to take out. That's as simple as I can say it. The reason that I spend hours in the morning, sometimes I'm up at 3, 3.30, and I'm spending sometimes anywhere between 4. Sometimes if I have a day at home, I might be in there eight hours. People say, well, lazy sitting in a recliner reading a book. I'm reading the Word, and I'm not just sitting in a recliner. I'm in a recliner because eight hours is a long time to sit at the table. And, and so I'm in a recliner so that I can be comfortable enough to stay focused upon what I'm doing. And Holy Spirit is speaking to me, and I'm getting revelation. I'm, I'm learning how to explain Scripture through the Holy Spirit's voice. That's the purpose of that. But I can't stay home. At some point, I have to come out and I have to influence the people around me. And that's the balance. We've got to learn how to balance isolation and influence. If we stay too much on the isolation side, we become monks who separate from society and don't get involved in the world's activities. But we're supposed to be in the world just not of the world, which means we have to be in the world. There's the influence. We isolate like Jesus did in prayer for a few moments or a few hours, and then we take what we learned and we go out and we teach that or we perform it. That's the call of the New Testament church. So, the last two points are huge. Acts 2.42 says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, koinonia, to the breaking of bread, that's eating together. And it, it, it can mean communion, but you've got to be careful. It's not necessarily the right of communion. It's actually the corporate oneness of communion. And the prayers. Again, the prayer circle is, in, is, is a crucial part of this thing. My house should be called a house of prayer. So what happened? What happened is they had discipleship. The apostles' doctrine is learning what Jesus taught. And then the fellowship, that's koinonia, which is divinely inspired fellowship. It's not carousing. It's not you and your buddy going and doing something mischievous. It's divinely inspired fellowship where we are encouraging one another and building each other up. It is communion, the merging of our personal in intimacy with our corporate oneness. And we're going to have communion later today. And I'm going to explain it again, that this isn't about you and your sins. Communion is about our oneness and unity. And we got to stop looking at it as getting absolved from our sin. we got to look at it as becoming one body unto the Lord and to each other. Okay? And then prayers. Prayer, in that instance, is defined as exchanging our wishes for God's wishes. We don't pray for those things that make us comfortable. When we pray God's will, we're actually usually praying for things that make us uncomfortable, which is a good thing, because if you're not stretching, you're, you're, you're getting atrophied. If you're not stretching your muscles, they will atrophy. If you're sitting in a recliner 
20 out of 24 days, hours of the day, you will eventually become an invalid. My dad, because of some of the medical issues he had, he had a horrible uh, bout with Meniere's disease, which made him lose his balance. So he couldn't, sometimes he couldn't walk, and we didn't want him to try because he would fall and hurt himself. And uh, so he was in a recliner or in bed uh, most of the time, just getting up to go to the bathroom, get up to go to the kitchen table, and then back. And by the time he passed away, I mean, it was like, it was like so much work for him just to get up out of the bed and, and go somewhere to, to the bathroom. He had to have a walker, all kinds of stuff. And it's because, because of his illness, he had to just really um, stay in one place and his muscles atrophied. And then I look at people in their 80s and 90s who exercise daily, and I mean, I'm like, it's just amazing. I was actually, uh, someone made me watch Dancing with the Stars this, this year for a couple of episodes. And uh, there was a lady dancing there that was 71 years old. It was, a, it was a star, I can't even remember her name. She was 71 years old, and I'm just like, that's what I wanna be when I'm 71. I don't want to be my dad at 86, and, and I mean, you know, it was like, it was hard for him just to reach over and grab something because of that. And I don't want to atrophy. So we've got to continually be stretched. We've got to continually be using what God has given us so that we can be active right up until the point where he calls us home. So, discipleship, fellowship, communion, and prayers. That was his... That was his order and protocol for how to build the church. And then in Acts 2, 46 through 47, this is the last thing I'll talk about, and we'll go to communion. And every day, every day, they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people, and every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. You want to see growth in the church? Yep, we've got to go back to a healthy balance between isolation and influence. Whatever we do inside this building has to propel us out into the community so that we can influence the culture and change it into a kingdom culture. Simple. Simple to teach. Harder for us to do, isn't it? I'm with you. There's days I don't want to go into this culture or this world. There's days I want to isolate. There's times when I think, give me a cave and a mountain and my Bible and a candle. And I'll just stay there. I can monk with the best of them. And I had to learn... I had to learn to control how much time I was monking. And when I did that, that's when ministry exploded. We were going to a church down here. We were part of the lead team. And uh, I was going up about every three months to a little abbey up uh, near Dubuque. And you could rent a room and just monk. And so I was doing that about every three months. And uh, I was just growing like crazy. I was growing in the Word even more than I had, and um, I was just getting so much good stuff. And then I was bringing it back to where we were ministering, and uh, we were in a men's meeting one day, and I had said something that the Lord had revealed to me, and there was an old former Baptist minister that was going to our church, and he still believed a lot of his old, uh, you know, Reformed theology stuff, and Baptist manifesto and all that stuff. And, um, and he just said, it sounds like psychobabble to me. And I thought, that's interesting. That's a, that's a new term I can start using. Here's some Jesus psychobabble. It may sound crazy to you, but it's actually the truth. And so we talked for a while, and we didn't agree so much on stuff. But afterwards, he came up to me. Stand up, Cheryl. He came up to me. Now, he towered above me. He was a giant man, probably 6'2 or 3, probably weighed about 250. And, and his goal, I'm not joking, his goal was to die fighting a bear. 
He said, if I'm going to go, I want to go out in a blaze of glory, and I'd love to fight a bear. So I don't know how that matters, but anyway, so he was a big man. And he came and he put his arm, he had to bend down a little bit, put his arm around me. He goes, I'm so glad you monk, because it helps us all. I had to learn to balance that, because I'd rather just monk all day and phone it into you. But that's not what we're called to do. So I had to learn to balance this isolation with how we influence the church and the culture and the world around us. The process is easy to talk about, and it's harder to do. So I'm going to challenge you just to think about these things. I want to challenge you to just write these notes down from the Bible app, or if you like, I'll make copies the notes because it's just the scriptures and, and the principle that I taught this morning. Uh, I just challenge you first to be open to isolation and spend some time just you and the Lord so that when things happen, you've got his perspective instead of man's perspective because they aren't always the same. Even in the church, they aren't always the same. I want to challenge you to do these things and I want to challenge you to, to, uh, to intently leave the isolation and become the influence that God created you to be in this world and in our culture today. Amen? Let me pray for you. Then we're going to go into communion. And then Carol will lead us out. Carol will be the benediction. So, Father, we just thank you that your word is really clear. And uh, especially in this area, it's, it's, uh, it's, just, it's not confusing at all. You've listed out the principles of what it means to be isolated to you and yet influencing the world at the same time. And so help us in our journey, Father, to, to turn off the TV and turn off news talk radio and to turn off the influence of the world long enough to hear you and long enough to get uh, to get um, uh, influenced by you so that then we can leave our uh, quiet time and begin to influence the world around us the way that you have called us to do. And so I pray that anointing, I pray an impartation upon every person here to want it, to do it, and to balance isolation and influence and watch the multiplication multiplication that comes from that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.